Hi, Pratt, welcome back. <laughs> hi, oh. hi. So I will just uh, introduce you a little bit for everybody. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker this afternoon, Prad uh, Boon Bisikunchok. Um, Prad enjoys a, a diverse career as a composer, a pianist, a forte pianist, and a researcher. His composition Night Suite was praised for its ingenuity and imagination by George uh, Benjamin. Um, as one of the selected composers commissioned for the uh, Endelion uh, String Quartet's 40th anniversary season. His Rightus for String Quartet was described as a work of great charm by The Guardian. And his ensemble, the Linos Piano Trio, won the first prize and audience prize at the 2015 Melbourne International Chamber Music Competition. And in 2020, uh, released its premier recording of CPE Bach's complete piano trios with Cavi Music. The recording has received critical acclaim from BBC Music Magazine, Süddeutsche uh, Zeitung, and Rondo uh, Magazine. And it's also been broadcast on BBC Radio 3 and uh, other stations as well. Uh, he is currently an artist in residence at Trinity Laban Conservatoire in London, a researcher in Tom Beggin's research cluster, uh, declassifying the classics at Orpheus uh, Institute in Ghent, and teaching piano and chamber music in the junior division at the Royal College of Music in London. So he's very busy with many things, I must say. Um, we're very lucky to have you here. Uh, today, uh, Pratt will be speaking with us about uh, the Forte piano and specifically about his work as a composer in relation to this instrument. So uh, thank you again, Pratt, very much for being here with us today. Thank, thank you, Elisa. It's slightly embarrassing how many things I'm doing, but this, this um, relates very much to what I'm going to talk about today, especially how the virtual world um, brings many fields together and how the um, boundaries have had to be broken and how I have been um, quite interested in that from, from, from earlier on. Um, my work at the Orpheus Institute um, um, is centered around historical pianos. And as you probably noticed that um, with as a historical pianist and as a composer of con concert music, um, everything that I do sort of belongs to the pre-digital realm. In fact, you know, I sort of long to um, go back to the past. Um, and uh, on the surface, um, what I do have very little to do with virtuality. Um, but the fact that I'm here, I'm sitting in Cornwall, you are in DC, Elisa, and Professor Chua from Hong Kong, everywhere, a lot of people in Bangkok. Um, this alone testifies to the sort of um, permeating quality that virtuality has um, into all of us. And um, Therefore, you know, and also listening from uh, to speakers from fields that I may otherwise not intersect with has more than a few parallels to the inter interdisciplinary nature of my work, um, which may after all be not be entirely out of place here in this symposium. Um, so I'd like to share just a few thoughts about um, following on from Professor Chua's um, my take on time, which is um, on a slightly different scale. Um, I'm just going to try and sh share the screen. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> I don't seem to be able to move the slide. One second. Ah, fantastic. Okay. So there's some just a few thoughts on temporal virtuality. Admittedly, as a performer and composer of mostly live concerts that take place in concert halls, uh, my relationship and interactions with the virtual world is no more specialized than those of my colleagues in the bro broadly categorized classical music world. Um, but it was when at the fringes of my research, I stum stumbled upon the worlds of Ludo, whoops, <laughs> Ludomusicology, um, 
which is computer game music, which I believe there was a um, workshop earlier this morning, um, that, and more recently, the edited volume on music and virtuality by Sheila Whiteley and Rambaran, that sparked the thought that the idea of virtuality might somehow encompass beyond the digital world. And in fact, I came across this um, quote in the 2016 edited volume. As a concept, virtuality can initially be understood in relation to its very opposite, um, the, as it were, unvirtual, the real, the actual. And this concept gave rise to a postmodern sensibility in which the real is understood to be increasingly replaced by the simulation of the real. Um, and when I came across this, I realized that it has a lot of parallels um, with one particular discourse that was going on in around 1797 when Mischmeyer in the new piano treatise was advertising a whole bunch of smaller domestic pianos. Um, and he was um, saying that if you're gonna buy a piano, buy the small ones that can fit in your house um, and it has all these pedals that can imitate um, many things, the harp, the mandolin, the snare drum, and even Spanish music. Um, so all this is possible by employing all these pedals and stops and I can show you a brief picture of um, one of the sort of piano. This is not the, the, the small type that he talked about, but if you see the four pedals, um, this is an instrument at the Orpheus Institute. Um, in Milchmeyer's treatise from 1797, he talks about how you replicate and simulate um, other realities using basically technology of the time. Um, <coughs> And <clears throat> so if that, as it were, a kind of pre-digital virtual, um, there was a kind of backlash in the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, 1798 review of this book, um, which said, oh, by the way, the Mischmeyer um, treatise, I think talks about mostly um, instruments that were popular in France and England. Um, so. He, um, this reviewer, um, anonymous reviewer K, um, said, we Germans prefer to stay with our Stein instruments on which we can do anything without stops. Um, so you could see that there was already a kind of a discourse going on between um, the real and the virtual, and the virtual being somehow perceived as a little bit of a charlatanism, and that the real experience has to come sort of genuinely from the embodiment of the performances, as it were. Um, but if we fast forward to the later part of the 20th century, where we saw the rise of the historical performance movement, um, in a way, ontology and performers' intention aside, there is an element in historical performance that is about creating a kind of a virtual past um, through technology, but this technology is that of the historical instruments, we somehow recreate a kind of different reality than the present and the prevalent one. And I'll go into that a little bit more later. But with this, you know, playing on old instruments, we are creating a kind of temporal reality. Um, <clears throat> and for this, I will just give a very brief history on the piano. And um, forgive me, those of you who know this very well, but I think it's um, worth just sort of refreshing our memory, especially in relation to the, the new book by Michael Latcham, who talks about the beginning of the piano as not being just by Christofori as we, uh, as popularly, um, disbelief. He talked about um, the Hedelstreit Pantalon, which was an instrument which is kind of a very large um, hammered dulcimer instrument um, that was going around in 1698, um, just around the same time, but in a very different location than the Christophori. Um, the Hedelstreit was 
active in the German-speaking world, and Cristofori was um, in the Italian part. Um, around the same time, we know very little whether they had much to do with each other, but Latcham thinks probably not. So there was a kind of a parallel um, uh, discovery going on, and therefore parallel and different um, emphasis with the pantalon being much more um, about these sort of open sound and um, less to do with the loud and the soft, but much more to do with resonance. And, and, and in fact, reviews of the time talk about these um, huge um, resonance that the instrument had. So it's also about resonance. It's not just about um, expressive content. Um, and then somehow Hebelstreit, um, because he was a performer, um, died with his instrument. Um, he was not an inventor as such, but Cristofori's instrument was, on the other hand, too expensive and, and very difficult to make. Um, and there was no repertoire for it. So there was a long gap until Zilberman um, described a new action in 1736. Um, and Zilberman, um, as we know, is connected with the Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach um, sphere. Um, um, the father of Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach visited um, his son and improvised famously on 7th of May 1747 on this new Hammerflügel um, and I think had a few criticism on it which Silberman then later improved. Um, Zilmerman taught a bunch of people who then went to England and Zumpe, um, being one of the first um, German piano makers who arrived in England, made these small and very affordable square pianos. Um, and he talked about them in 1766. And this was related to another of, um, another of Johann Sebastian Bach's son, um, Johann Christian Bach, who was active in London. Um, then we have the clavisan d'amour of Spart, which Mozart um, definitely came into contact with. Then things accelerated. You have the first English grand pianoforte by Bacher, um, and then the Mozart famous description of Stein's Prelzungen, uh, which is a mechanism that um, is very uh, sophisticated. It allows you to play much faster and articulate much faster. Um, and this is what became known as the Viennese and the South German action um, eventually. That influenced Anton Walter. Um, then we have the Broadwood, the founding of the Broadwood and Company. And as you can see, things accelerated around this time and technology was going as fast as, well, perhaps even faster than I change my laptops and mobile phones um, these days. Um, and then in 1796, we have a sort of game changer, which was Erard's escape mechanism, which then um, led to the um, eventual development. I won't go into the 19th century because then it become complicated, but as we know, um, <clears throat> it became the modern piano as we know it. But <clears throat> talking about forte piano in this case becomes very complicated because as you can see, there was not one forte piano. But if you look at the map of Europe um, and look at all the musicians who were working around that time, you know, we have J.C. Bach in London, we have C.P. Bach um, up north, <coughs> um, then Mozart, Salzburg, South Germany, Augsburg, Beethoven, Haydn in Vienna, and um, this chap in Paris is Beethoven's um, nemesis, or rather the other way around, um, uh, Steib Daniel Steibelt, who had a um, duel with Beethoven um, in Vienna. Um, and I'll go into that later. There's a little fun story. But anyway, my point is that they all had their own sort of spheres of instruments that um, were somehow connected, but not always connected. And it depends on where they live, who they worked with. And all these lines show various um, connections. 
Um, and in writing music for the forte piano, um, well, I set out to write music for the forte piano. I came across this um, very complicated problem because not only then I realized, oh dear, well, what if I only have um, uh, access to a Stoddard piano and I want to play some CPE Bach, then it's um, very, very difficult. Um, in which case, you know, I might as well play on the modern piano and all such. All these questions sort of came about. Um, and then I put myself again, perhaps in the center of the equation and asked myself, so if these, inf these composers had their own spheres of influences, um, what are my spheres of influences? And um, admittedly, it's around these composers, which are basically my repertoire. Um, and if I had to choose one instrument, what would it be? Um, ideally, I would have access to all of them. But then if I go back to the slide before, you can see that certain instruments have more of a centrality that were shared among um, more composers. And this is why we somehow have come to define the forte piano as this sort of thing, which is a kind of a Viennese South German model, um, simply because it commanded a more central central role, not at that time, but it commands now a more central role around the repertoire that we 21st century musicians play. Um, so talking about all these spheres of influences, I, <clears throat> I went on to think about more of the forte piano as a kind of a boundary object borrowing from the, the, the field of indis interdisciplinarity. Um, and identified a few more boundaries because as a composer, then there are certain other fields that are involved. So we have the sort of classical music at large, which is um, the 20th century and the 21st century um, sphere. Then we have historical performance that arose in the late 20th century. Um, they intersect in some way. We have musicology, which had some historical and organological components and intersect yet again with all these worlds. Um, and on the other side, we have composition practice and even experimentations of con uh, contemporary music experimental um, sphere. Um, I'm active, as you um, can see, in a little bit of all of these fields. And I see the act of writing new music for the forte piano as a kind of um, merging of these boundaries. So the issue then is that these different fields think differently about what the piano, the, what the forte piano is. If you talk to a, you know, your general classical music um, audience and your general classical music composer, they, and you talk about the forte piano, it is viewed um, as opposed to the modern piano. So this is sort of the, I would say the prevalent um, understanding of what the brown piano is versus the black piano. Um, but if you look into the spheres of historical performance and musicology, we go back to the graph that we had before and there were many pianos um, and everybody is interested in their own fields. You know, some would be interested in the pedal, some would be in the Silberman piano, the action, um, there are all sorts of pianos. Um, then if we go back in time around 1780, let's say, um, the forte piano was a new technology. It was um, conceived and perceived um, versus the older harpsichord. So it was the height of technology at the time. Um, 
And if you, we look further back into the 20th, 21st century again, we'll see that the experimental contemporary music will use it as a kind of a sound object alongside um, all sorts of Harry Parch instruments that you see here. So these arrangements um, present the fortepiano in many different realms and they all have, sh they all share um, the objecthood of the forte piano sort of differently. And in writing music for this instrument, I seek to somehow combine um, as many ways as possible of seeing the instrument so that I would not just be coming from one perspective. Um, so I, again, borrow the concept from Lee Star, the idea of a boundary object and the object that are, that have two components, the material components and the processual comp components. And I, I sort of saw how the material object lives in this realm of fascination with the mechanical object and the sound object, the experimental world and the organological world. Um, and the processual object um, is about the historicity. It's about the change. It's about time. It's about moving from the harpsichord to the technolog technological advances of the different pianos and also about historicity which is the um, old instrument trying to recreate some kind of a virtual, of a temporal virtuality. How do I combine all these things? Um, well, I'm still finding a way really, but um, one way that I stumbled upon um, in the past couple of years was to look at technological um, incidences in the past and especially striking to me was this Mozart's letter to his father um, when he was having the um, famous duel, uh, they loved duels back in the, in the days, musical duels. Um, interestingly, in, in Thai music, there, there was also this tradition, which I'm very keen to find out more about. Um, but um, Mozart went through great trouble to borrow the, his favorite piano of Countess Thun. Um, and he wrote to his father, we had to choose a theme from the sonatas and develop it on two pianos. So they were improvising, um, taking turns on two pianos. The strange thing is that I had borrowed the pianoforte of Countess Thun, but I would use it only when I played alone. That's how the emperor wanted it and NB, the other piano was out of tune and three of its keys stuck. So the emperor asked Mozart to go on the piano which had stuck notes. Um, and the emperor said, it doesn't matter. Well, Mozart said, I'm giving this a very positive interpretation, namely that the emperor already knows my pianistic skills and expertise of music. And he wanted to hear what the foreigner could do. The foreigner in question was Clementi. Um, and they proceeded to, to have a duel and um, the emperor declared that they, uh, there was a draw. Um, I suppose he was being diplomatic. Um, <clears throat> but I was fascinated by how Mozart would have improvised on a piano with the keys stuck. Would he have ignored the fact that the keys were stuck and just played regardless? Or would he have used um, the stuckness of these keys to make certain um, musical points? Um, we don't know how stuck they are, but if I were to guess from having played um, on many historical instruments, not in top shape, um, it's possibly the dampers are not coming down because that's a very sensitive bit, you know, very subject to humidity change. So um, what I did was I emulated 
simulated the stuck keys and started to improvise um, using um, these sort of devices to make the keys intentionally stuck. And I played a couple of concerts where I asked the audience member to choose um, a stuck, three stuck notes. Um, and I improvised a Mozart fantasy, um, pop Mozart style fantasy using these stuck keys. I then created a kind of a stop, um, the sort of stop that Milchmeier was talking about, um, but an, a historically informed extended technique called the Sordino stop, whereby you can choose which notes um, were to be stuck. And I wrote a piece on that. We won't go into that today because we'll hear um, a piece later, um, which uses this and you will see in the video, but I just wanted to um, explain where it comes from. Um, emboldened by this, I went on to look at another kind of um, stop, which was the lute stop that, that Milchmeier said that it could emulate the lute. And I wonder if this time I could have clip um, one, please, um, just to show how the lute stop works. Um, do I have? Uh, sorry, I'll check. While this is going on, um, I'd like to point your attention to it. It's very hard to see, but the, I'll play a few notes and there will be a, a sort of a felt thing that comes to touch the string very subtly from underneath near the, near the nut of the, um, near the sort of the piece of wood at the, at the beginning um, of the screen. And that changes the sound. Um, so here's clip one. I don't know if that's clear, but you can see the, the bit um, below the, um, just next to the nut move up and down. Um, and then let's have clip two and hear it in, on one of the smaller pianos that Mishmaya talks about, um, the lute stop. Now it comes on. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen again. Is this working? Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, and in the second clip, you, you, you heard this piece. Um, and if you see in my example here, you could see that certain notes, um, and this was very common for for these stops not to work perfectly on all the notes. And you can see that the, the highlighted reds were, if you can remember how it sounded, there were some notes that really stuck out because the, the lute stop didn't quite work. And these imperfections, as it were, I think is part of the realities of such instruments. You know, not, I think probably not so far away from our, all our Zoom lessons with all the sound um, going in and out. And I got rather fascinated by these involuntary selection of notes um, to do with the, the buff. The, the, this stop is called the, the buff stop, um, which is something that comes into contact with the string. So I created um, my own version of the buff stop, which, sorry, which, um, 
you can choose where it touches the strings. And when you do that, um, it is possible, I don't know if this is coming across, probably no sound, but um, this is part of the first stage of experimentation that I did. Um, the, the, the buff stop that I created um, changes the length, the speaking length of the string, rather like the clavichord. And with this, I was very excited because for the first time um, on the piano, I could use microtones. Um, and for a very, very long time, I've been fascinated by the tunings of Thai instruments, um, and especially the theoretical tuning of the seven tone equal temperament. And for the first time I could create using this, um, rec recreate the Thai instruments sound and, and temperaments using this. And so I have decided to use all these stops in the piece that I wrote at the beginning of this year. Um, called Prometheus, which is a kind of an anti-variations based on Beethoven Opus 35. Now, let me go through very um, briefly on just reminding you on how the Beethoven Opus 35 um, set of variations work, which I call the Prometheus variation. It's based on the baseline of the final scene of the ballet Prometheus, and his creatures. And this is also used as the finale of the Eroica symphony. So there is a kind of a heroic um, face, heroic obsession going on. I think it was also a great time of experimentation in, his, in Beethoven's life because he wrote to his publisher that these sets of variations um, were employing the newest, um, a totally new way of writing music. Um, and what was striking was um, this, these repeating three notes. So if you remember the beginning of the um, variation goes. And then you have these weird repeating three notes. And then something rather bizarre um, and disjuncted. And then he proceeded to create some of the most amazing and extended sets of variations um, that he had yet to, to write. Um, these repeating notes come back in many ways um, in the even hidden away, sorry. And even when it in the bass, and it becomes the bass line only. Which is really bold when you know, the, the actual bass line of the, of the piece um, becomes a really small note and the big notes are just B flat, just sticking out. Um, and I was fascinated by this. And so I, let's skip this, um, created a kind of a scheme, transposed the theme to into F um, because of the technical limitations of these stops and um, found a general structure that the beginning has this sort of angular tonic dominant relationship um, in the theme. The second part is something much more chromatic, sort of much more tightly knitted a bit of the theme with the secondary um, dominant going towards the dominant. 
and then we have the repeating notes B. And then a kind of a reconciliation of the cadence. So there's sort of four um, large topics, as it were, embedded inside the theme itself. Um, and what's fascinating to me is how in the Opus 35 variation, you can also map the large structure of the, of the, of the piece in, in four, four sections as well. You have the introduction with the bass and the counterpoint variations. Then you have the theme and the variations. And the most revolutionary variation is the slow one, um, which in itself is almost as long as five or six variations together. So it's um, the slow variation is almost a movement in itself. And then you have the fugue in the finale. The symphony, however, he sort of switches it, uh, um, the fugue around and the finale involves the slow variations. Um, but in my Prometheus, so I've written a piece called Prometheus for the fortepiano and viola da gamba. Um, for the fascinating fact that the viola da gamba was dying out um, at the time that the piano was starting to come to be. So the, this sense of um, Janus-like looking backward and forward in time is embodied within the piece, written in the 21st century um, on an 18th century instrument. Um, I sort of arranged it also in four sections and the beginning you will hear a kind of a rhythmic counterpoint based on certain repeated notes um, with microtones and then the theme comes in um, when the gamba finally uses his bow to play, play. Um, then there will be a long section of the um, on on the sort of dominant pedal um, with the gamba and the forte piano playing in some kind of canonic um, forms. And the conclusion is a kind of hypnotic um, use of this rhythmic motif. Which you will hear again and again. Um, so um, <clears throat> all this is just to share some of my thoughts on my work that I've been doing this lockdown. Um, and I, so I'd love to share clip number four, which is the whole of the performance. It takes about 10 minutes. And then I'd love to um, hear thoughts, comments, questions. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Pat, very, very much for that, um, for that um, very interesting very talk interesting and, uh, and uh, composition. composition. Uh, I really, uh, I enjoyed it a lot, I have to lot, say, have to uh, say uh, personally, uh, personally, I find it uh, especially, uh, especially uh, exciting, uh, exciting to get to um, hear new music hear for, new these, music uh, for these, these instruments, instruments that I, I personally am going to associate I, exclusively with, with older repertoire. I find it very um, vitalizing. I can feel them being uh, brought to life in, in a new way, which is uh, so exciting. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, questions for you, I, I think, um, one thing I was thinking about as you were talking is, um, you know, of course, as a practical matter, composers in the uh, 18th century and uh, even 19th century um, accepted that their music would be played on any manner of instruments by the public, right? Of, of course, you know, scores were even published where it would say just keyboard, not necessarily forte piano or harpsichord. Um, you've made a, a virtue out of the limitations of these uh, instruments and used it as a source for artistic inspiration. I'm wondering um, if in your uh, compositions you, you envision, or in compositions going forward, if you envision chance being a part of that, because some of the time when I think about uh, the limitations of these instruments, I, I imagine a world where it was very random, right, where, you know, you might have to play on a piano that has a shorter keyboard than you expected or different notes kind of stick. And um, if there's a kind of flexibility that that um, created, the performer had to deal with with that. And if that's uh, some inspiration for you, if that's something you will compose around or with. Thank you for that. Yeah, actually indeter indeterminacy is a, is, is a big interest of mine because you know, it's a kind of a paradox in a way, because as a composer, you want to write things down, which is to de determine how the music goes. But um, the realm of the composer back in the 18th century, at least, um, was much less than than what had become in the in the early part of the 20th century. So um, I didn't go into this because there wasn't time today, <laughs> but a lot of the notation that I've used for this piece um, is indeterminate in that um, the rhythm is created. So all these complex cross rhythms um, are created through um, the instruction for the performers to use parts of the body. So if you use, you know, this part of the finger, it plays so fast and this mm. plays a little slower and so on. So mm. um, there was no notation um, or some of the notation are do is done traditionally and the, the other half of the piece is written with this sort of new semi aleatoric way using the bodies and the instruments. Um, so, yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. But that's probably for another talk. About sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Um, the the other thing I I thought about as you were talking is um you know of course you know we're talking so much about technology today and you talked about some parallels between um you know our, our virtual reality now and creating things uh, you know compared to how things had to be created for early pianos and. You know, I, I think of pianos, of course, they are a technology and they were being updated all the time. This was, you know, just like iPhones or, or anything else that we're dealing with now. Um, and I, I think of it also as an instrument um, that was largely designed to uh, imitate um, other, other instruments. And, and, you know, you talk about that with stops. And from my own research, I think of that in terms of the orchestra, just in terms of 19th century, um, let's say transcriptions of symphonic repertoire, bringing music you know, into the home that would have been public. Um, so really it's more, more of an observation than a question, but I, I love how you're also using uh, the, the forte piano to imitate some Thai instrument sounds. And sort of you're, you're recapturing this, uh, I think sort of, chameleon-like nature of the of the instrument itself, where it can, in, in some, it has these capabilities to imitate uh, other instruments, and I, I find that really fascinating. Thank you. Um, so I think um, I'd just like to open up the floor for uh, other comments uh, and questions from from other participants. there are any here. 
Hi, Daniel. Hi, that's a great piece, Park. Um, I was just curious about your thoughts on time. As a kind of time traveling that's going on here, right, in your work, because, you know, I, I was, you know, when, when I was listening to this piece, I was so much reminded of uh, how uh, instruments were so different in their timbre even then, and also about tuning, right, and, and going back to different types of tuning. And, um, and then I was reminded of even things like Monteverdi, where, you know, he would have all this kind of mean uh, temperament tuning, and things would sound kind of out of tune and so on. And then you have this kind of new sound, world, but you're bringing it almost uh, now to the 21st century, but you're helping me hear the past actually uh, in so much of this music. So, so I was wondering about the way you think about the past as you write this kind of music and how actually you're making it more alive in a way uh, than say just the, say, say uh, you know, hip practice or something like that, where, you know, you just, say you just played the Beethoven uh, variation on the 40 piano, right? It's, it's, you know, you're doing something different to my ears. It's almost bringing me back to an earlier world. Um, so I just wanted some comments on that sort of thinking. Thank you. I mean, one of the <clears throat> great paradox um, as a historical performer is that, you know, you can do all these things. You can um, play on old instruments, read all the treatises, but the ears of the audience can never be replicated. That's right. That's you know, right. Um, back then, um, Beethoven Opus 35 variations would have been revolutionary, unheard of, and, and completely fresh, um, probably incomprehensible to many of the ears. And a central part of my research is, and I haven't really found you know, an argument for this, maybe Daniel, you can help me with it, um, is how in juxtaposing new music for old instruments with old music, perhaps for new instrument or for, or for old instrument, putting them next to each other, you bring a kind of listening to a different realm. Um, the, the, it refreshes um, our experience of the music. So when I perform this piece next to the Beethoven variations, I find in myself and, and the feedback from the audience is that they hear the piece, the Beethoven, in a fresher kind of way, and they hear my piece more like um, an older piece. Um, um, and I've basically this is you know the main reason why I've set out to do this. And and thank you for um, <laughs> catching on that. No, I think that works really well because you know I you help me to hear the forty piano. Uh, in a fresh way, right? Whereas normally I would just hear it like, oh, that's not quite a Steinway <laughs> kind of thing, right? Uh, so I think it was brilliant in, in, in doing that. Thank, thank you. Uh, well, thank you both for um, a really wonderful uh, afternoon. Very thought provoking, um, very enjoyable. So we, we really appreciate uh, your time and your insights. And uh, thank you to everyone who's, uh, who's with us virtually. It's been a, a great session. And uh, we hope we'll see you again at more events. So um, please uh, take a look at the website, the symposium website, to see what else is uh, going on um, today, tomorrow, and, and through the week. And I, I hope to see you, uh, you all again sometime soon. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Elisa. And, and thank you. Great. All right. Take care.